Well, you can at least tell that we're having class today at noon. Uh, we're in our accommodations this week, preaching in revival at a nearby Bible-believing church. And it's just time to study the Word of God. I'm excited. We're beginning John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And normally, I do not try to cover as many verses in the class as we will today. But the nature of the paragraph is such that we're going to have to look at verses 1 through 10. Let me read verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher gravesite and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Mm. Very interesting verse. Let me count them. Three time markers here. First day of the week. Mary Magdalene came early. That's the second time marker, early. Here's the third one. It was yet dark. One source I studied said that indicates to the Roman mind somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m. while it was yet dark. She's coming back to the place of Jesus' burial. Uh, could I make an announcement? He came out of that grave the first day of the week. I, I want to temper that statement a little bit. He arose on a Sunday. A Sunday. That's why we believers worship, go to our churches and worship, yet to this day on Sunday. No longer on the Sabbath which means seventh day, which is Saturday. That's Jewish territory on. We now even call it the Lord's Day. John used that term, the Lord's Day, in the book of Revelation. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early. This is needs to be explained, I guess. Matthew, Mark, and Luke... I went back and read them. All name other ladies who have come with Mary Magdalene to the tomb. They don't know it yet, but to the empty tomb. But John, who is often different than the synoptics, that's why we call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptics. It means from the same point of view. John sets his camera up at a completely different vantage point. John says, was Mary Magdalene. Now, is that a contradiction? It is not a contradiction. John merely mentions and highlights one. Oh, let me tell you something about the Gospel of John. It focuses on individuals. Jesus' interview with Nicodemus. One man. The Samaritan woman, one lady. The man at the pool that Jesus healed in John 5, one person. The man born blind in John 9, one person. Raising Lazarus from the dead, one person. Mary Magdalene. One person comes to the grave site. Wow. I think John does that because he wants, rather than emphasizing big groups, he does mention Jesus feeding the thousands, the multitudes. But normally, one individual at a time, John's your go-to book for the long interviews of Jesus, the soul winner, Jesus. I think John does it for this reason that Jesus might have the preeminence. 
Somebody say amen. That Jesus might have the glory. That Jesus might have full focus. It's not about this group. It's not about the. It's about our Lord and our Savior. We're still in verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark to the sepulcher. Remember that word sepulcher? Uh, the, uh, the Greek noun has built into it the place of memory, a memorial where you would go and reflect on the life of the dead individual you loved. And she seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Oh boy. That verb seeth is spelled B-L-E-P-O, blepo. It means to see concretely. It means to see something as far as the height and the breadth and the width and, and, and the de to see with one's physical organ the eye and she sees the stone has been taken away from the sepulcher. Or oh, here's our favorite verb, taken away, A-I-R-O. We had it last lesson, Iro, to lift something and take it away. The stone has been lifted and taken away by an angel, Matthew tells us. John doesn't mention that. Matthew says that God sent an angel to roll the stone away. But that's the same verb for my Savior who I row, took my sins away. John 1, 29. There's something more than that stone that got I rowed, taken up and moved away that day. Jesus died to wash away, to lift and take away my sin. Mary Magdalene, seeing the stone is rolled away. Do notice that uh, no more, verse 2, let's go to verse 2. Then she runneth. She cuts loose running. The verb is treko, Greek, T-R-E-C-H-O. It literally means running with all your might. She is running. I think not to get away from the tomb, but to get some good news to somebody else. She's running. That doesn't tell us a lot. Mary is running, but it does so. She is emotionally involved. She is excited about the resurrection of our Savior. I wish we could get a little more emotionally involved. He lives. Christ is risen. Where's she going to run? And she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter. Oh my goodness. She cometh to Simon Peter. Would you all reflect with me a minute? Last time we saw Simon Peter, he said, I don't know these disciples. I'm not one of them. Then he said, I don't know this Jesus. He had denied our Lord three times. And the first person... Mary wants to see and tell the news is Simon Peter. By the way, do notice it says Simon Peter. Simon, his fleshly name. Peter, his God-given spiritual name. We see his two natures there. Could I say something? And it's absolutely astounding. Peter is a leader in the early church. Peter will preach the great sermon at the day of Pentecost. And, uh, and he's fallen. He's denied. Someone said this. It's worth writing down. Peter denied our Lord, but he did not desert our Lord. Demas, that's another matter. Paul said, Demas, having loved this present world, he's left. He deserted me. He's departed. But Peter denied he didn't depart. Mary Magdalene is going to the not perfect, having messed up leader, spokesman in the list of the disciples. Peter is always mentioned first in all four lists. She's going to him. I might say this. Peter fared better back in that day 
The disciples are ready to forgive and forget. Jesus is ready to restore him and does so in the next chapter of John, in John's epilogue. He fared better in that day than he would today. I'm afraid we're in an unforgiving day, a, a, a bitter, a resentful day. And uh, she came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. The implication there, in fact, the grammar there, she went to Peter's house or Peter's dwelling. She knew where it was, apparently. Then from there, she went to John's house to the to the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I'm declaring it. I'm identifying him as John. John the Apostle. John in this book is reticent. Doesn't say much about himself. John in his gospel never names himself by J O H. -N. He always is that other disciple or that disciple Jesus loved or that disciple leaning on Jesus' breast. I find five times. The commentaries say there are more, but I searched last night in 15, 20 minutes. I can only find five times where John has identified the disciple whom Jesus loved. The disciple that loved Jesus. She found John and said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him, Tithomy, where they have placed him. Somebody's come and taken the Lord. They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. That's the news she gives to these people. Notice what she didn't say. Listen carefully. She did not say, he's alive. He's done it. He came out of that grave somewhere our Savior's walking around fit and well. And she didn't say that. Somehow these early disciples did not pick up on the dramatic, fundamental truth that Jesus is going to be raised from the dead. But from what I read here, the thought of the resurrection did not even enter Mary's mind. Wow. We're going to learn when we get to verse 9, if we get to verse 9, for as yet the disciples, they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Jesus told them three times. I went back and looked. Mark gives us the best scenario. Jesus told them in Mark 8, I'm going to be crucified, but I'll rise again. He told them again in Mark 9, I'm going to be crucified. And he told them again in Mark 10, three times, three witnesses, three sermons. And yet they didn't get it. The moral of that story, the principle involved there, we can hear preaching once, we can hear it twice, we can hear it three times, and we still might not get it. We still might not comprehend. Tell me the story again and again. I'll, I'll learn it eventually. But notice what she did say. We've looked at what she didn't say. They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. My mouth is getting dry. Class, you'll just have to bear with me. They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. Notice what she just called Jesus. The Lord. L-O-R-D. The uh, Greek noun there, kurios, means the supreme one. The uplifted one. And, uh, oh, watch this, please. Jesus to Mary Magdalene is Lord, whether he's dead or alive. To her perception, he's dead. He's been buried. Somebody's come and taken him away. And, uh, and uh, they've taken away the Lord. And we know not where they have laid him. 
Isn't that beautiful? I want him to be my Lord on the good days. Somebody say amen. And I want him to be my Lord on the bad days. I want him to be Lord of everything. I want him to be Lord of all. They've taken away our Lord out of the sepulchre. Verse number three. Verse number three. This leads to a second meeting. Two men running, running down toward that sepulchre. I need to read it or I'll get behind time wise. Peter therefore went forth. And that other disciple, Peter and John, notice as you study your New Testament, how many times Peter and John are paired. Time and time again, not only in John's gospel, but all the way over into the book of Acts. A beautiful team they make. Peter, who's rather loud and boisterous. John, who's rather meek and quiet. They, they, they work together well in the service of our Lord. Peter went forth the other disciple, and they came to the sepulcher. They've arrived. So they ran both together. Now John gives us a little flashback. He's going to describe the trip from their homes to the grave site, to the sepulcher. Uh, I mean, uh, verse 4. So they ran both together. Treco again. There, by the way, Paul said, uh, when I preach, 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 1, 2, 3, Paul says, pray the word of God can have free course when I preach. That's the verb treco. Paul is actually asking his hearers that when he mounts the pulpit, when he preaches, pray that the word of God can run. Pray the word of God will be cut loose. Pray that the word of God will have liberty. Flow from heart to heart. They ran together. Now watch this. And the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. Oh boy. The other disciple, be John, he did outrun Peter. He got there ahead, the Greek implies. He got there ahead of Peter. Why? <laughs> Duh. He ran faster. Why? He's a younger man. He's a much younger man. And, uh, and uh, just that, but, but then again, I see here the different temperaments, the different personalities of those who serve God, of those that some are quicker than others. Some are more deliberative than others. Some, uh, they're too quick to talk and others fail to talk at all. All different. Somebody said in the Lord's garden, he's got all kinds of flowers. Variegated, many, many different colors, many different heights, many different breadths, many different fragrances and aromas. I just thank God I'm in the garden. Hallelujah. John came first to the sepulchre. And, and may I say this? For some reason, John wants us to know he got there first. It's mentioned three times in his account. So uncharacteristic of John. Verse 5, John, the younger disciple, and he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying, yet he went not in. Differences in disciples. John's a little hesitant about going. When Peter finally gets here, he doesn't stop for a second. Boom, he's in there. He's going to. But John, stooping down, looking in, he saw the linen clothes lying, but he went not in. Oh, what a lesson here. Let me, let me elaborate the principle. Stooping down, he saw inside, he saw the Lord's grave clothing. It's never called that in John. He saw the linen clothes the Lord had worn uh, when Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus wound him and wrapped him in, uh, uh, for uh, burial. He saw the, he wouldn't have seen it had he not stooped down. I'm going to say that again. He would not have seen it. He would not have seen it had he not stooped down. There's a, there's a spiritual truth there. 
Well, I'm, I'm reading I'm reading Romans 9 through 11. I'm reading the book of Revelation. Uh, I'm reading Deuteronomy, and there's a lot of it I don't understand. Stoop down. Stoop down. Get on your knees in prayer. Beg Almighty God to open your eyes. Psalm 119, verse 18, that you may see beautiful, wonderful things out of His Word. He stooped down in order to see in. As long as I'm tall and haughty, as long as I'm unwi unwilling to humble myself, I'll never see the truths of God. He stooped down, looked in, saw the landing clothes, but he didn't go in. There's something special, class, about those linen clothes. We'll see it in a moment. Verse 6. Then cometh Simon Peter following John. And I, in my mind's eye, I say, Peter. <laughs> That's old Peter arriving at the grave site, exhausted. He might have been a little heavy. I don't know. Nothing like John in physique or in spiritual temperament. Then cometh Simon Peter and he went in to the sepulcher. He went in. Ice erka me. It means he went slap into the middle, into the midst of the sepulcher. And uh, he saw, he too saw the linen clothes as they were lying there. And this time the verb, he saw thoreo, thoreo. It means to look with inspection, to look with scrutiny, to examine care. He saw, that mean he picked him up. He saw the linen clothes lie as they were there. Mm. And he saw the napkin. That word napkin one time in our King James New Testament is translated handkerchief. It's a head covering. They would have wrapped around our Lord's head. They saw the napkin. They saw the napkin. Uh, I've got to find my verse again. Uh, not lying. The napkin in his head. Not lying with the linen clothes. But wrapped together, that's a key word, wrapped together in a place by itself. The verb is tuliso, T U L I S S O. It means uh, wound, wrapped together in a place by itself. Can I tell you what I think they saw? We know already from a previous lesson uh, that Joseph and Nicodemus used a hundred pounds of powdery and yet sticky and gummy when moistened uh, fragrance, anointing fragrance, paste, salve with which to prepare Jesus for burial. This is what they would do. They would wrap sheets, linen sheets. No, it, it is translated in, in Acts sheets, but strips, linen strips. They'd wrap around his body and then put some of that embalming aromatic paint and they'd wrap again. Wrap again. Y'all follow me? They cast when they break an arm. The doctor puts on the cast and they'd wrap again. More fragrance, more paste and they'd wrap again and, and, uh, and then up to the neck and then the head would be wrapped in a place separate from that. That's what they saw, but here's the unique thing. What they saw are undisturbed grave clothes. They saw, and again, it's never called, with Lazarus, it's called grave clothes. Stinks, a, a nauseous smell about it. Decay, he'd say, never called grave clothes with Jesus. He didn't stink. He didn't decay. His body is incorruptible. Thank you. He said in Psalm 16, Father, you will not allow me to see corruption. Thank God Jesus didn't. But they wrapped him in that fact. And here is Jesus. Well, I better rephrase that. Where is Jesus? He's not here in this tomb. This tomb is empty. And, and uh, yet the grave clothes are there. Still wrapped. Still encased, 
still like a cast that you could somehow slide your arm or your leg out of still, still in their fixed position. Wow. One writer called it undisturbed convolutions of the grave. Now, time out a minute. Did I make an announcement? If that's the way it happened, if his grave clothes are still laying there, nobody stole that body. There's no way you can extricate that body from those grave clothes and them still be in their original fixed position. Nobody stole that body. That's proof of that. But it's also proof that Jesus, he came through those grave clothes. He came out of that grave. He was resurrected literally in a life. He's wearing garments of glory now. Hallelujah to his name. <laughs> Something about those grave clothes that caught both Peter's attention and John's. Oh, oh, verse 8. Then went in also that other disciple. After Peter went in, John, John followed. And, and uh, he saw and he believed. John saw and he believed. Believed that Jesus is God? No, no. John has believed Jesus is God from the time that he met him, from the time he was regenerated, born again. He believed Jesus is alive. He believed Jesus. Uh, no way he's dead. No way they stole anybody, stole his body. No way some, uh, uh, he's alive, he's alive. He has to be. Uh, he left behind a, a cocoon, as it were, and, and the beautiful, beautiful butterfly has, has gone away to liberty and safety. He saw it, and he believed something about those girls. It is so interesting. John believed when he saw the grave, when he saw the linen cloth in their original position. Mary believed when she heard Je next lesson, when she heard Jesus say, "Mary, Mary," when she heard uh, their voice. Uh, the disciples believed when Jesus stood before them that day and said, "Here I am. Could I eat a bit of fish and, hun and, and honey come?" Thomas believed when he was invited to put his hand in the nail-scarred hand or in the wound in the side. But this chapter, showing all of those then, this chapter says, but blessed are those who've never seen and believed. Blessed are those who have never looked and yet they believe. That's you and me. Praise God. And then verse 10. I would think it would say, then the disciples went and called a meeting and helped no. Then the disciples went again unto their own home. Unto their own home. And the Greek there, they went again to their own home. It's something like this. They went to their own place. They went to where their own possessions were. Or they went to where their responsibility happened to be. I've always thought that's unusual. You're telling me John went home? John didn't say, Mary, let's gather the whole crowd. Let's, uh, let, let's have a service. Let, let's pray and invite the Lord to show up in our midst, which will happen later. No, John says, I've got to go home. Did I read it right? Then the disciples went away again to their own home. Why are they going home? Do you remember at the foot of the cross of Calvary? Jesus said, John, there's my mama. Take care of her. Mama, this is your new son, Jesus, obeying the commandment, honor your father and your mother. Saw that mama was taken care of. Jesus is dying. He'll be resurrected, but he's going to ascend to heaven a few days later. And it says after Jesus turned Mary over to John, John took her. John took her to his own home. I guarantee you what he did. When he believed, when he knew Jesus was alive, when he saw those undisturbed linen cloths, he said, I'm going to the house. I'm going to tell Mama. <laughs> I'm going to tell Mary. I'm going to tell the mother of the humanity of the Lord Jesus. He kept his word. He's alive. He's alive. Mary Christ is risen indeed. I believe that's why he went to his own. I, uh, this, this story... And I do not mean fabricated. This factual story, this account of what happened on the morning of the rest is precious to my heart and my soul. She runs to them. They run to the grave. They make some deductions and they're convinced Jesus is 
alive. Hallelujah. Can I say it? Jesus is 